Welcome to our webinar for uh, gambling entities. My name is Mr. Lamini, and I'll be joined by two of my colleagues, Brian Arumudam, who is a senior manager uh, in, corporate, in corporate governance at the National Gambling Board. I'm also joined by Wungosi Numalo, who's a senior systems compliance analyst at the FIC. So uh, today, we are going to uh, take you through to uh, our webinar and then we are going to discuss a lot of uh, uh, issues and then if uh, you have any questions can you just please pack them until uh, uh, we are going to respond to them at the end of the webinar apart from that uh, there's a register that we are requesting you to uh, complete and then uh, once you have uh, that uh, register will be able to respond uh, to any questions that maybe we won't be able to cover during the session itself. Apart from uh, the register, we are also going uh, to... Uh, apart, from, apart, from, apart from responding to the questions, we are going to cover uh, all the things that are going to be covered on the, uh, on the topic for the day. So, as we mentioned a bit earlier, I'm just going to take you through to our agenda and what we are going to discuss for the day. And the first thing that we are going to look at is a AML CFT regulatory overview. From there, we're going to look at the proposed schedule updates and then the supervisory bodies. Then my, our colleague uh, Brian is going to take us through uh, what the National Gambling Board says about AML CFT in the gambling industry. From there, Bongosi will take us through uh, registration and reporting. Then the remaining time will be reserved for uh, questions and answers. Uh, as I've mentioned a bit earlier, I'm, my name is Mr. Lamini and I'm from the Guidance and Prevention uh, Department at the FIC. The first thing that you're going to look at is the regulatory overview of the ML uh, CFT. ML is anti money laundering and CFT is combating and uh, financing of uh, terrorism. So what, uh, the, the first part of the day is looking at the Financial Intelligence Center. What are the functions of the Financial Intelligence Center? So what we do, we process, we analyze and interpret information uh, reports that we receive from our stakeholders and then we monitor and give guidance to accountable institutions. We supervise and enforce compliance with the FIC Act and then we also look at money laundering and tourist financing control regulations. We also uh, issue some directives, uh, guidance notes, and public compliance communications. If you are looking for more information on these guidance and direct guidances and directives, uh, please visit our website on www.fic.gov.za. So the FIC Act doesn't function as a uh, loan legislation. There are other supporting legislations that when we are applying the FIC Act, we have to look at. So those are the Prevention of Organized Crime Act and the Product Tara or the Protection of Constitutional Democracy Against Terrorist and Related Activities Act. So in a global sphere or in the a broader uh, sphere of things. The mother body or the, uh, the, the authoritative body that will look, that give guidance when it comes to anti laundering and terrorist financing is the FATF, but we'll go uh, we'll delve deeper into what the FATF entails a bit later into our sessions. From there, we have a regional uh, body. So South Africa falls under the ESAA MLG uh, Body. So the ESAA MLG uh, stands for Eastern and Southern African anti money laundering Group. So in South Africa, so we went globally with the FATF, regionally we have uh, the, the ESAA MLG, and locally in the country we have the FIC. Apart from the FIC, we have other supervisory bodies, uh, which are the Financial Sector Conduct Authority, which uh, regulates uh, first piece uh, collective investment schemes and then other authorized users of, of exchanges. We have the South African Reserve Bank, and then that looks after banks and life insurers. We have the state agency affairs board, independent regulatory state agency affairs board looking after state agencies, independent regulatory board for auditors. We'll uh, just touch uh, to the IRPA, the relation to this presentation as well. Legal Practice Council, 
uh, National Gambling Board. And then uh, Brian, as I mentioned a little earlier, will give us more content on that. And Provincial Licensing Authority, NGA. The FIC, uh, on the other hand, also uh, regulates uh, the motor vehicle dealers when it comes to uh, uh, money laundering and tourist financing, crew rent dealers, trust services providers, and trust services providers. But we are going to uh, enlighten you a, a bit later as well with where these particular entities will fall uh, in the proposed amendments that are going to be effective in the coming few months. So as I mentioned a bit earlier, so the first step that we're going to look at is the FATF, uh, Financial Task Exchange Force. So this is an intergovernmental body for setting international standards and measures for uh, combating money laundering and tourist financing. So the guidance is based on 40 FATF uh, regulation, uh, regulations on ML and CFT. And in 2003, there was a mutual evaluation when South Africa became a member of the uh, uh, money laundering uh, body. And then it was, it's similar to what the peer review is. And then the second one was in 2009. The last one was in uh, 2019. For more information on peer review as well, uh, or mutual evaluation, you can uh, go to the FATF website, which is www.fatf-bafi.org.org for slash. And then the financial actions force, financial action force continued. So as we mentioned in the previous slide that we have 40 recommendations, but the ones that are more prudent for this particular discussion will be recommendation one. So we'll only mention two that we are going to discuss for this particular sitting. So recommendation one uh, stipulates that uh, countries should, uh, should understand money laundering and tourist financing risk and they need to apply a risk-based approach and allocate resources in accordance with risk. So financial institutions uh, to identify, assess, and take effective actions to mitigate their money laundering and tourist fin financing risk. They also need to apply a risk-based approach uh, effectively to combat uh, money laundering and tourist financing. And they also need to understand the money laundering risk rating, particular, which is specific to their uh, industry. And the Commission 22, these are needed non-financial business professions. So FATF applies a threshold as opposed to the FICX, but uh, on the FICX, there are no thresholds uh, that applies. So all gambling entities are described in Schedule 1 uh, to the FICX as accountable institutions. So as well, uh, uh, talking about the risk-based approach and then the risk indicators that the gambling uh, industry needs to look at. The gambling, uh, the gambling industry is a cash in, uh, intensive industry. And then in most instances, you won't be able to identify the beneficial owner of any transaction that is being uh, put forward. And then, so we need controls. Uh, in most instances, we need controls against that. And we need to be aware of the beneficial owner of that particular transaction that will be taking uh, that will be partaking in. And there's a perception that the industry is controlled by criminals uh, of gambling uh, entities. And then international losses, there are lots of losses, and then that one will come to it a bit later as well. And then some people open casino accounts to clear or launder their money. And then someone will pay cash for chips, then uh, redeem the cash via EFT transfer, uh, purchasing chips for a higher price uh, from uh, clean players. So that's another way that people use to clean money. And then some people uh, draw casino checks and then they make them payable in cash. Uh, combining winnings and cash so that uh, you layer the money or you confuse the person or who, who's, who has a keen eye on where that money is coming from. So these actually these vulnerabilities were, were published uh, by the FATF on an article that they, they publi uh, that they put forward in 2009. The next part that we're going to look at is the schedule updates or the proposed schedule updates. So as we mentioned uh, earlier that uh, currently uh, gambling institutions fall under item nine of the FIC X schedules. So that is a person who carries on the business of making available a gambling activity as contemplated in section three of the National Gambling Act. In respect of which a license is required to be issued by the National Gambling Board or a provincial licensing authority. And then uh, more detail will be, for, uh, will be given to us by uh, our colleague from the NGP. So consultation paper amendment to schedules. So these are the proposals. This is a proposal that uh, was put forward 
on uh, the scheduled items of the FIC Act. Uh, FIC is to become the main regulator for, from an AML and safety perspective. And then currently scheduled, uh, under Schedule 2, we have uh, supervisory bodies, which include the Financial Services Board, the South African Reserve Bank, Executive Agency Affairs Board, Independent Regulatory Board for Auditors, National Gambling Board, Law Society of South Africa, Provincial Licensing Authorities, and as defined in the National Gambling Act. So the concession paper was uh, published on the, uh, during November 2017 by uh, the then Minister, and it was approved it, a recommendation from the centre that the FIC start a process to exit the agents affairs board, airbag gambling boards, and law societies as supervisory bodies focusing on AML and TFC. And then in 2009, also the initial evaluation of 2009 commented negatively on the low level of compliance within certain non-financial sectors and the absence of robust framework from supervision and enforcement to address non-compliance with the FIC Act. So these are the measures that are taken to fulfill the request that was uh, put forward during the 2009 mutual evaluation. As a result, uh, during June, uh, in, in June 2020, and then the proposal the amendments were published and now uh, the public and anyone who was interested was invited for comment on uh, the amendments and the comments were received and then was still just uh, waiting for the uh, the relevant government department to give us a, a light on how far away we are with the proposed amendments and then now i'm going to hand over to my colleague uh Brian who is going to take us to who's going to take us through the anti money laundering and service financing uh, in the gambling industry Thank you, Super Susan. Uh, as you're just setting up that presentation, um, I, I found it very interesting the the comment that you made uh, when you were speaking about uh, the FATF um, assessment, risk assessment, that um, there was a, uh, a reference to perception, perception of the industry. And uh, I was sitting here just as I'm listening to you. I'm thinking of um, I think it was 1975 when Steven Spielberg made. Uh, a film about a shark attacking people. And since then, um, it changed the perception of great white sharks. They became um, something that people demonized. And uh, it, it's taken a while for us to, to look at them better, better than that. And um, in a similar way, the influence of um, the media and television um, has had its effect on the gambling industry. Uh, notable, notable movies like Martin Scorsese's um, uh, classic Casino, uh, is a case in point and um, it, it, it's presented in a glamorous way, also in a dangerous way. But um, the reality is that um, it's not actually uh, an industry that's run by crime lords. Um, these are not organized thugs that will take you to a back room somewhere and break your fingers with a hammer if they catch you cheating. It's actually much more boring than that because it's very highly regulated. So I just want to take you through um, what uh, is the uh, the regime in South Africa for, uh, for gambling, and then how the there's compliance with, uh, or from a regulatory point of view, how we've ensured that there is compliance with FICA, and then just some practical examples of how um, uh, casinos um, and other operators have um, institu uh, implemented controls, practical controls that uh, mitigate the risks around um, money laundering and um, possible terrorist financing. So, firstly, in South Africa, uh, are you getting the full presentation? I think yes. Is it full screen? Not yet. It's not full screen. It's just getting it. <clears throat> uh, 
Sorry for the technical error, colleagues. Uh, we're just having experiencing a bit of a technical glitch, and we are just going to come back to you now. Now, just bear with us for a few seconds, and then we are just everything is, is stuck somewhere. We don't see why is that is that. So our technical team is busy working on it. Is okay now. I think we'll be well. Almost the colleagues just bear with us, with us quickly. Uh, and then we are trying to move, and then. Ah, there we go. Now I think we're good to go. Apologies for this. We just had a small technical error and our presentation was stuck. Thank you. Over to you, Brian. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Um, colleagues, apologies. Um, I'll just try and catch up a bit. I was um, indicating that I'll start with the gambling in South Africa. What are the modes that we have legalized? We have uh, primarily four modes that are legal in South Africa. We have casinos, and ca when I say casinos, these are the land-based physical casinos that you can walk into. Um, casinos that are available online um, or through an interactive means are not legal in South Africa. So the first uh, thing that I must emphasize is that we are talking about land-based casinos. Then we have bingo. Bingo has two forms. Uh, the traditional form of bingo is a hall where you'd have a number of tables. It's where people sit and uh, when the game starts, numbers are called and you have a card and you start looking on your cards uh, and marking off numbers. And if you pick up rows, you shout bingo and um, you can win. So it's an inter it's, a, it's, a, it's a game that involves uh, two or more people. And the traditional form is in a room with people sitting around a, a number of tables that has been adapted into an electronic form. So they are electronic bingo terminals that you could also find, uh, but uh, also uh, legal if there is a license granted for that. And um, although you're standing at a machine alone, it's it's linked to other machines so that you are still playing bingo with other people, although you can't necessarily see them. And then we have uh, limited payout machines. These are uh, slot machines that you'd um, predictably find at pubs or restaurants, places like that. It's usually, um, it will be a few, sometimes a few machines like up to five, or you may find uh, in a big establishment up to 40 machines. But the limited payout machines, um, what defines them is that firstly, where at, the, at an institution where you would find, or, or at a business premises where you would find these, it will not be the primary business. There will always be a primary business um, uh, at that premises, and then the limited payout machines are incidental to that. The second thing that uh, defines it is that the maximum payout per game is 500 rand, which is quite a small amount. So this out of the four modes is the one that most uh, most uh, points towards the reason why we legalize gambling in South Africa, which is for uh, recreation. Gambling is intended to be a social exercise and not a means of trying to get rich quick or, or supplement income. So you'd look at something like limited payout machines and see that this is just generally for you to be able to spend a few rands, uh, entertain yourself and go back and not expect any any big winning. And then uh, lastly, we have betting the betting and bookmaking that would be on sporting events, horse racing events. Um, that's where you can go into um, a physical outlet and do your betting or these um, uh, operator, license operators are able to offer you their services through their websites. So that will be online betting, but that would be um, strictly betting through a license operator when, when I say online. Anything else that's online outside of uh, a license operator would of course be Ill an illegal activity. So um, everything that then is offered through a license operator is then subject to the um, the regulations, the legislation and regulations that are in place in South Africa. So in um, in South Africa, we have the National Gambling uh, Act into the, that came into effect in 2004, and that is the overarching legislation for the gambling industry. And then each province, each of the nine provinces will have a a piece of legislation that would be for their province, a provincial uh, legislation relating to gambling as they would conduct it in their province. Each provincial piece of legislation would be aligned to the national legislation. 
And uh, the reason for this is that um, in terms of how the, the structure of gambling is in the country, the National Gambling Board does not grant licenses. Licensing is done at provincial level. So each province has uh, got has allegations in terms of numbers and uh, for licenses and conditions that uh, they can um, um, implement in their province. And uh, the National Gambling Board then provides um, compliance oversight over all the provinces in terms of compliance with the national legislation. So between the national legislation and its corresponding regulation and the provincial leg legislation and their corresponding regulations, um, the industry is very carefully uh, regulated. Then the last thing I just want to mention is that um, lotteries, of course, are not part of the discussion. They do not fall under the gambling industry. They are regulated by the Lotteries Act and um, they, the institution that one would uh, look to if you want any, uh, any conversation on lotteries would be the Na National Lotteries Commission. So as I've indicated, licensing is done at provincial level and the provinces would still ensure that they are licensing in compliance with the National Act, the NGA. So the NGA, uh, Section 37 of the NGA, then sets out in terms of licensing that um, licensees must comply with the NGA and then be, my emphasis in red, the Financial Intelligence Centre Act and applicable provincial law within any province uh, in which the licensee conducts, engages in, or makes available the licensed activities. So it's already um, in, the, in the National Act that there has to be compliance with uh, FICA. And similarly, if there's going to be uh, non-compliance and um, the license were to be suspended or revoked, uh, that would be the examples of cases where uh, it would be serious enough to qualify a suspension or revocation of a license. Um, you'd see in uh, 43.1c2, the licensee has contravened or failed to comply with an obligation of accountable institutions in terms of the Financial Intelligence Center Act, insofar as it applies to the gambling industry. So again, the, the requirement to comply with FICA is very serious and, and directly linked to the uh, existence of the gambling license. And then anyone who works at uh, a gambling institution at a gambling operator, sorry. If you want to be an employee at, at an operator, there are very stringent conditions that uh, must be met for you to qualify to be an employee. And then you would need to uh, receive an, uh, a license as an employee license. Now the conditions are that you need to be, you, you cannot be under 18. You cannot be a public servant or political office bearer. You cannot be on the list of excluded persons. This is a list that we have of people who voluntarily or um, through referral by someone else are uh, excluded and uh, excluded from institutions because they believe they have a gambling problem and uh, need to be prevented from having access to gambling activities. So that's the excluded persons. And then if a person is subject to an order of a competent court that holds the person to be mentally unfit or deranged, that's also an excluding factor to be an employee. Um, if you've ever been removed from office, an, an office of trust on account of misconduct relating to fraud or the misappropriation of money, that goes to your, your integrity. Uh, similarly, if you've been convicted during the previous 10 years of theft, uh, fraud, forgery, or uttering, perjury, um, any of those offenses, and were sentenced to an imprisonment without the option of a fine or to a fine exceeding the prescribed amount, unless the person has received a grant of amnesty or a free pardon for the offence. So these are the strict conditions that uh, everyone, the probity that is conducted for everyone who applies to be an employee at, a, at an operator needs to need to meet these and exceed these requirements. Otherwise, they would not be able to be an employee. And I'll come to this, uh, the importance of this uh, shortly. And then similarly, for people who are applying to be a license holder, if you're applying for a gambling license, then there, there's probity conducted again for, for applicants of um, gambling licenses. Similarly, you cannot be an, uh, an operator if you're under 18, or if you're a public servant or political office bearer, if you're listed on the register of excluded persons, if you're a family member, um, or you are a family member other than a brother or sister of a person who is a member or an employee of a regulatory authority, excuse me, exercising oversight over that licensee, that would be the, the potentially the, the provincial licensing authority, or if the person is an unrehabilitated insolvent, if they are not a fit and proper person to be involved in the business uh, that they want to get involved in, 
or they are subject to an, or, uh, an order of a competent court holding them to be mentally unfit or deranged if they've been removed from an office of, uh, of trust or on account of misconduct related to fraud or the misappropriation of money and similarly convicted uh, during the previous 10 years as I've indicated with the employee license. So again, these are these are the um, standards that an applicant for a gaming license must be able to um, to meet. If you fall short on this uh, during the probity that is conducted during the application stage, you, you won't get a license. And if during the course of you having a license, it is found that uh, you have now fallen foul of these requirements, you then would not be able, that license would be revoked. So um, when considering an application for a license, uh, or an, uh, an application for an employee, uh, employment license, or if you want to transfer a license, if the new person wanted to take over an existing license, the the province, the which is the licensing authority, may request any additional information, written authorization from the applicant, um, uh, permitting the licensing authority to procure information directly from third parties and authorizing such third parties to provide that information, or, and I've emphasized in red again, a report from any other regulatory authority, the Financial Intelligence Center, the National Director of Public Prosecutions, or South African Police Service. So again, the the reference to uh, compliance and uh, with with FICA and communication with FIC in order to make a, de a determination, it's built into the National Act. And then Section 16 of the National Act. I just mentioned this as well because um, in terms of Section 16 of the National Act. If any person which uh, could be a, an, a gambling operator or a bank or financial institution has money that it wants to pay over to someone who uh, is claiming a gambling winning, but suspects that, that person is either a minor, an excluded person, or the activity that they uh, engaged in was um, possibly illegal, would not be, they are, they're not permitted to pass that money on to that person they are required to transfer that money to the National Gambling Board in order for us to investigate the circumstances and establish whether indeed the person was either a minor, an excluded person, or if the activity was illegal. If none of those um, are applicable, then the money will be paid over to the punter. If we find that uh, one of these are applicable, then the money would be forfeited to the state by way of a high court application. So again, there's a control to prevent monies being um, paid over to people or people benefiting from money if there's a suspicion that there was any impropriety involved in that uh, gambling activity. So um, I didn't mention um, earlier that uh, I, I will then talk about some of the uh, practical ways that uh, operators now have tried to implement controls that will reduce and uh, prevent prevent the happening of uh, any money laundering or financing of terrorist activities. As indicated by Super Ciso, uh, earlier, the approach is risk-based, so it's not simply a matter of compliance, but it's a question of looking at where the greater risks are and putting in more emphasis on those areas. So firstly, all gambling, uh, licensed gambling is aligned to our um, legislation requirements, as I've indicated. Everything that is that is done through the licensed uh, gambling industry is very carefully regulated, and then internal controls that the operator will implement will will be um, approved by the licensing authority. So they need to satisfy the licensing authority that they have met certain requirements and have implemented the controls to give assurance that there would be, for example, compliance with FICA. And then um, all operators are subject to regulatory, internal, and external audits. So as operators, they, they are subject to oversight by the licensing authority, which will be your regulatory audit. Then they themselves will have um, auditing and uh, they are required to be audited both internally and externally. So there's, there's uh, various ways in terms of how there's external scrutiny of their transactions and their conduct and their, their activities and whether they are complying uh, with the various regulatory reasons. Then um, operators generally, and in particular casinos, do keep a record of all winnings and payouts. So they, they, they would know when someone has been paid out and um, if there's a query at a later stage that someone has alleged that they went to a certain casino. Uh, for example, if, if um, Brian is arrested with, or SARS picks up some money in his account and he says, well, he, um, I, 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 I were to say I went to Monte Casino and I played and I won money there. It's very easy to 
be able to investigate and establish whether or not I had won money because there is a record. It would be recorded that I won on a certain date and the amount that I was paid out. If that record doesn't exist, then I never won that money at that casino. Then in terms of know your customer, they uh, cannot deal with anonymous players. So there's various ways in which um, ID is built in to the transactions. Um, when a person, there's, there's two card systems, for example, um, you'll have your loyalty card, which is a longer term card that you'll keep for yourself. And then you would have, uh, if you come in for a day, you would you'd be able to use a, have a temp temporary card issued at the machine. It's, it, you could do the self-service. And uh, if you had a place where they provide that, but to have a card that you'd use to go to a machine, to, uh, if you want to, to gamble, you would have that, uh, that machine would require you to scan in your ID. <coughs> So the issuing of when that card is operated, um, it's easy to pick up the ID of the person who was um, using that machine and gambling at that time using that temporary card because of the, the need or the requirement for ID. Um, and then um, if you are playing below uh, 5, 000, the 5,000 threshold, you'll be able to play with cash. But um, when you go, or, or rather when you're using your temporary card, you'll be able to play. And when you go to the machine, you, to cash out, you would be able to cash out your winnings under 5,000. Again, it required your ID. If your winnings exceed 5,000, you won't be able to, to cash out at that uh, device on your own. You would then need to go to a cash desk. And then at the cash desk, not only will, will already you've, you've had your ID produced, but they will then do a phys physical verification by looking at and checking whether you are indeed the person that's uh, displayed on your ID. And then only would you be able to receive that winning. And then, um, there's also that, um, th that perception that a person can um, play a number of times with small amounts and then uh, constantly going to play and building up a sort of a, an audit trail or record that you've been gambling. So you, you would go later on and say, I, this 50,000 that I have was won over a, a number of uh, weeks or, or months and that's how I, I, I arrived at this amount and I want to go and cash it out. That really wouldn't work because you actually, when you are playing, each time that you play, you're putting in money. So if you if you were to to calculate a a um, a winning, you would need to the and and it's it's able to be detected through your use where how much you've put in versus how much has been paid out to you. So we are able to say whether there's a net winning or not. Otherwise, you've basically been uh, just taking out your own money. And then in terms of uh, table games. Um, you would have to go to the cash desk. If you have won at a table, you will need to go. To, you wouldn't get your cash winning at a table and walk out. You'll need to go to the cash desk to cash out winnings, where again, you will need to verify that table winning and uh, there they will check your ID. Um, I think uh, to emphasize in gambling, um, people under the age of 18 are not permitted to gamble. So at all, it's at all operators, the signage is very clear that um, people under 18 are not permitted to gamble, so ID is mandatory in any event. It's it's not something that uh, is done through by operators solely for compliance with FICA or to support FICA, but uh, it is uh, a requirement in terms of gambling because under 18 is a minor, a person under 18 is a minor and is not permitted to gamble. So if you are playing at a table, um, the dealer will take names and surnames to start a table game, and then if you win, the dealer will then call an inspector to come to. Um, verify and confirm that there was a winning. Then they would call a put boss <coughs> who walks around the casino floor and would then be able to come to then verify that uh, there was the that there was a winning and that um, it it had been a, a, pro a proper winning. Then you'd be able to go to the cash desk to cash out your money. And again, cash desk means ID. Now, if you wanted to take out money you would need to have some form of collusion between these people because you've got independent people coming to cross check before you get to the cash desk to get your money. Um, and then, as I'd mentioned earlier, we have the property checks for employee, employee licenses. So it's very unlikely that you, it, not that it can't happen, but uh, the standards that they have set for employees um, are very high. So the likelihood of you being able to bribe someone to, to collude with you are, are greatly reduced through the um, the standards that have been set for employees to have uh, employee licenses. In addition, um, there's surveillance, surveillance being cameras, and um, this the areas are very uh, carefully um, monitored, particularly in casinos. Uh, I think this is the only time you can uh, then say that the movies that you watch are accurate 
because um, they are obviously very vigilant against people coming to cheat or try to to commit any type of criminal activity on a, on a casino floor. Um, similarly, with other licensed operators, they would have um, cameras and would have some form of surveillance, including security, to be able to monitor the conduct and behavior of people, especially if uh, physical behavior means you may pick up that someone is behaving suspiciously or there's some activity that uh, you can detect and it will alert you to to be able to intervene. Then we are we also will have segregation of functions and duties to make payoffs as I've indicated. So it's not a straightforward thing that once you win, you have one person who release your money and you walk out. So um, I think that that is to address that uh, possible gap where you would need then to have people involved with you in within the operator's um, employee structure to assist you to launder money. And then further preventative uh, measures, the slot machine uh, note accepted would reject die, stained or fake bank notes. Um, table games um, would uh, generally be equipped with the UV lights where they can check bank notes and only rand based uh, our South African currency bank notes would be accepted at slot machines and table games. Um, there would be note counters that uh, detect dice when, when it's a larger amount of money. They would detect dice stained or fake notes through optical, uh, ultraviolet or photographic checks. So again, there's, there are controls to check whether people are coming in with large quantities of money that uh, may either be counterfeit money or um, there are some, there's something suspicious about um, that activity. Um, and then in addition to the employers uh, having licenses, in terms of um, awareness with the requirements, for example, compliance with FICA, employers involved in gaming activities do receive training. There's also internal awareness signage and posters that are put up, uh, operators would put up to ensure that their staff as well as the public are aware of what are the uh, requirements that they need to comply with. They, I know that uh, there are surveillance notice boards of suspicious persons, so the operators um, would, would, for example, if they have caught someone doing something that they and that they um, may have been arrested or maybe the person uh, uh, ran away, but they were able to from surveillance capture uh, a face face uh, picture of the person. Those are put up on notice boards. So all employees are able the 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 employees who are dealing with the gambling um, activities, gaming activities are able to look at those and um, uh, memorize faces so they can quickly detect if one of those people are re-entering uh, the gambling premises. And then there's very high visibility of cameras and the security presence. So those uh, serve as um, deterrent measures for people who may be tempted to come into the environment to do something. Um, I think um, there's an effort made for people to, to see that there's great vigil vigilance and uh, it's, not, uh, it's not a place where you'll easily get away with um, trying to commit some type of crime. Then other factors that contribute to anti-money laundering and um, terrorist financing controls. The, as I've indicated, the laws um, for starting from the national uh, legislation do incorporate uh, these reporting obligations and um, uh, controls. So there's the reporting obligation, the surveillance, record keeping, there's audit, segregation, segregation of functions and duties. All these are intended to uh, put in place. They are all controls to support anti-money laundering and anti-terrorism financing. Then direct and indirect shareholders are approved uh, and approved by licensing authorities as I've covered. The directors, gaming management and employees are licensed. Uh, I've covered that. And then also the gaming suppliers um, have to be have to have uh, licenses. And then the gaming equipment, every device would need to go through a certification process. The games and devices are certified. They go through rigorous testing and there are, there are pre-existing standards for games and devices. So again, uh, speaking about uh, perceptions that people have, these machines are not, uh, as operators would know, these machines can't be rigged. Um, you don't get a, a machine that goes hot at certain time and that's the time it pays out. The, those are misperceptions that people have. Um, these things are, are designed to be uh, tamper-proof and uh, not even within the control of the operator themselves to be able to tamper with. And then um, particularly if a machine pays out, for example, um, the machine, if it's a large amount, a significant amount on the casino floor, you'll get your lights and you'll get the sound. You think you've won a big amount of money. But the first thing that's done is the machine is switched off. It's opened and there's a check to see if the machine malfunctioned, if it had operated correctly uh, before the next stage goes into verifying the, 
uh, shall I say, the legitimacy of the winner to receive that winning. So again, very regulated. And then there's professional relationships uh, maintained uh, with FIC and other licensing authorities. Um, all transactions that are support that are suspicious are reported. Um, for example, and I think this is um, applicable to to other operators. I mentioned, uh, for example, your bookmakers. They would have online betting. But if you find that a person now, uh, when you want to when you want to gamble online with the, a bookmaker, if you want to bet on sporting events. You'll be able to go to their site um, and, and uh, create an account and you can put in money that you would use for gambling. So I would say, for example, go and register. I'll put in 2000 and that means that whenever I log in, I could spend 50 rand or 100 rand or so out of my money and gamble and I'll pick a sporting event and I'd say I want, I'm betting on these sharks playing on Saturday winning or whatever. And then if they win, uh, I would I would receive that winning to me back into my account. And then when it when I want to, I will be able to cash out from that account that I've created with them. Now, if the the operator uh, detects that I have created an account, I put in an amount of money, I haven't transacted or I've done some uh, very small nominal transaction for a small amount, and then I immediately am cashing out the whole amount again without really gambling. That becomes suspicious. So that would be reported because that um, that is the kind of uh, possible money laundering risk that we need to be vigilant uh, against. So those are automatically reported. And then, um, as I've said before, both the operators and the licensing authorities are audited. An example of the kind of notices I mentioned, um, um, courtesy of um, colleagues, um, operator colleagues um, sharing, this is a type of notice that you would find um, put up on their premises. Uh, this is a notice um, indicating compliance with the figure. It states that under all circum transactional circumstances, casinos are obliged in terms of the Financial Intelligence Center Act to obtain and rec record personal details which may require verification against your ID book or card, passport, driver's license or other documents acceptable to the casino. These details may include but not limited to full names, date of birth, ID, residential address, occupation, uh, prominent person status. A copy of the legislation and the list of persons considered to be prominent persons is available on request should you wish to peruse it. Um, if you're asked for your personal details, please remember it's not personal, it's the law. And uh, they've stressed prohibition on uh, private money lending. So these are, this is an example of signage that's put up um, specifically to ensure that there's compliance with the um, figure. Another example, uh, same message, it's not personal, it's the law. Uh, payouts are subject to the following identification requirements. If it's below 5,000, full name, surname and identification number. If, it, if it's above 5,000, Full name, surname, and identification number, a copy of your SA document, uh, South African driver's license or passport must be presented or be on record with the casino. Copies will be retained. Failure to comply will result in payments being withheld um, and, the, until, and the above identification requirements are met. So you won't get your money if you, are, if you refuse to comply. So that indicates, um, as I've said, that they have indeed adopted a risk-based approach. And uh, the industry is highly regulated and uh, regularly audited. The industry operates in the context of a global ga uh, gambling industry. So even the operators within South Africa are in communication with and do business with uh, other jurisdictions. Um, and and it's, it's really a, not an environment where you want to be found foul of this type of legislation. So you could get blacklisted and it would severely impact on your ability to, to continue in this, in, this, in this industry, in the global industry, I should say, in terms of gambling. So there is that uh, respect for compliance across the board. Uh, due to the controlled nature of the legal industry, it may be more likely that money laundering through gambling would be conducted through the illegal gambling operators where, where it may be a more, um, uh, can I say, a fertile environment for them to, to target. But um, that's not within our control and that's dealt with through law enforcement agencies. Um, but definitely through the license operators, it's a very carefully regulated um, industry. So I think uh, that's just what I wanted to share um, in terms of how we have, uh, as a gambling industry, taken steps to ensure that there is compliance or practical measures have been put in place. And um, yeah, I, I would be happy to assist with questions uh, at the end. Um, if there are any questions that are beyond my uh, ability to answer today, I will be happy to ensure that um, the correct answers are provided to the, to the person requesting it uh, subsequently. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. 
Uh, I see that he, Brian has already has also put in his numbers, so that if you are having any questions, you can give me a call anytime. But if you have any other, and then I think uh, thank you very much for that detail explanation. It opened my eyes as well on what it, it means to be a member of the Kevin Milling Institution and what we need to comply with. Uh, on that note, colleagues, I just want to remind you that please do not forget to complete the attendance register. It is attached on our Q&A uh, 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 tab. Uh, for lack of better, better, I was just looking for the exact word to use. And then please don't forget to complete that. And then the, this is where this particular uh, presentation is going to be shared. And then if you have any questions, as Brian has just mentioned a couple of seconds ago, please don't forget to type the, your question on the Q&A tab as well. Uh, without any further delay, I'm uh, going to hand over to our colleague, Bongosi uh, Numalu, who is going to take us through uh, reporting and registration. Bongosi, uh, a few seconds before we go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Um, okay, much appreciated. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. I think uh, that presentation uh, was very much insightful and we all learned from it. So uh, uh, the section that I'm going to cover is basically reporting and registration as far as the FIC Act is concerned. And uh, what is it that you need to basically do? So what, what my colleagues were saying to you, in fact, was what uh, you are supposed to do. So what I'm going to be covering is how are you going to do it uh, as, far as, as far as the FIC Act is concerned. OK, so OK, I'm going to cover two parts, uh, the registration uh, process on GoML and the general GoML functionality and the reporting as well on, on GoML system. Uh, just to reintroduce myself once again, my name is Bonkos Mumala. I'm from the Data Systems team within the compliance and prevention of the FIC Act. FIC uh, 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 institution, sorry. Okay. Okay, registration in terms of the FIC Act. Section 43B of the Act says all accountable institutions and reporting institutions must register with the FIC. So it, it is an obligation for you to register if you fall within uh, um, uh, if you fall within the the the, the accountable and registration uh, accountable and reporting uh, 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 institutions, okay. So okay, we have one platform at the FIC where you can uh, uh, register or report, which is the GoML. And to access it is very easy. You just simply go to our website www.fic.gov.za, and uh, when you're there, uh, just below the menu bar, you'll see a a tab that says click here to register or, or report. When you click there automatically, then you are on GoML. And, and from there on, you can be able to register or, or, or you can report if you have already registered. Okay, who needs to submit uh, the registration information? Okay, so the first person who's going to register uh, your entity at the at uh, the FIC, that person automatically becomes the compliance officer, and uh, any additional person who comes after that uh, becomes the MLRO, uh, what we call money laundering reporting officer. So okay, so that is very important. You must take note of that uh, that you are uh, obliged, you are obligated to register if you if you fall within any of the uh, uh, the schedules of the FIC Act. Okay. So what is it that is required when you register? 
with the with the FIC. So we'll need an authorization letter. Uh, the authorization letter uh, uh, will normally be a letter that states that you are authorized to register your entity, and you are authorized yourself as well to 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 be registered as a compliance officer. Uh, of the of your entity and you'll have to also attach either your your id uh, copy or your uh, passport if you are not a south african citizen okay so the registration process that i highlighted earlier very easy so basically we now going to have the compliance officer this is the person who has been elected at your entity as the compliance officer or as the super user if i may put it in a, in a layman's term that person then will log in uh, to the FIC, then go and on GML like I've highlighted earlier. And uh, under registration, you'll, uh, you'll click register as an organization and then complete all the fields, provide all the attachments, and uh, you submit your registration. So in case, uh, for an example, you want to um, uh, update uh, your details, you can also do that. And what you do then afterwards, uh, you'll wait for a confirmation email from the FIC uh, where you'll be in, it will be indicated to you whether your, your registration has been approved or it has been uh, rejected with the reason provided. And uh, if it's rejected, then you'll have to submit another registration again, providing all the uh, documents as well that I've highlighted earlier. Okay, to register as well again as a, as a uh, uh, or adding, let me say adding a new user. And then, uh, so it means you will have had a registration completed, but now you want to add an additional user on your profile. Um, so your uh, compliance officer or MLRO again will go uh, into your, your, your you, you'll go on GoML. And instead of selecting register as an organization, you will now select register as a person. And then please make sure that uh, on the OCK ID, you put your organization ID because that's where the linking process takes place, where you link yourself to your entity so that you can be able to see details associated with your entity. So, and then you then therefore submit the information to the FIC and then a confirmation email will come uh, uh, indicating whether your registration has been uh, approved or it has been rejected and then after that once you are registered then you can be able to uh, update your your details further and uh, start reporting if your, your your registration has been accepted and is successful okay reporting on gml okay so 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 there are two processes that must take place uh, before you report, then basically it's the registration, then report. So there's no way you can uh, uh, report to the FIC without uh, your entity being registered or yourselves being uh, registered uh, on the on the GoML system. So please take note of that and just take note that we do not have any other platform at the FIC to report. We not You can't report via email, uh, you can't report via a telephone. It must strictly be uh, on, on GoML system. Okay, and then uh, uh, we have uh, various modes of submitting reports. Uh, but still on GoML system. So XML uploads, I'm starting with the second one and the last one, B2B. Okay, these are bigger entities who have who are high, who uh, have uh, so much transactions to a point that uh, it's not easy for them to to report uh, a, a report to provide a report one by one or things like that. For an example, like banks who are having uh, high deposits and a lot of deposits that come through into their accounts. So uh, they, they, it's easier for them to do XML uploads or be it B2B. So this is an integration process that happens between uh, GoML system and their systems on their side. So, but if you don't have a, a huge number of reports, then you can use the individual reporting platform where it's just uh, web reports. So you simply go on GoML and then you log a report on GML after you have registered. Okay, that uh, three categories of regulatory reports that we have at the FIC. We have section 28, section uh, 29, we have section 28A. Okay, so if I may start with section 29 uh, uh, types of reports. 
Uh, these are suspicious and unusual transaction reports. In short, we call it STR. So uh, on STRs, uh, we have four different types of reports. So these types of these four different types of reports are further divided into two. So we have activity reports, we have transaction reports. So if you look at the first one, so it's suspicious and unusual transaction report. And the second one is a suspicious and unusual activity report which an SSAR, third one, terrorist financing activity report, TFAR, terrorist financing uh, transaction report with the TFTR. Okay, so STR, you file that if a transaction has taken place, uh, this trans okay, and I'm now referring to all the transaction reports. If a transaction has taken place, you'll have to file an, an, an STR or TFTR, depending on the type of suspicion. So for an example, if the suspicion is terrorist based, you know you're going to file a terrorist financing uh, transaction report. So, but uh, just take note that when you file this type of reports, we'll need all the information, for an example, the names, uh, the ID numbers, uh, uh, and the addresses, telephone numbers. Remember, you are not allowed to go into business with somebody you do not know. So by default, you will have these details because you already know these people that you are doing business with. So, but on an activity report, suspicious or unusual activity report or terrorist financing activity report, uh, there we take note that uh, sometimes uh, somebody, for an example, will come, um, come at your premises, go out, come, go out, and then uh, they want to transact and then the moment they register they, they realize that you have a registration process there and then they decide no you know what i, I no longer wanna uh, uh, gamble here uh, let me just go somewhere uh, because you guys are asking a lot of questions and then now you know that that guy was probably up to something so you're going to file a suspicious activity report or you'll file a, a terrorist financing activity report depending on, uh, you, on, on your suspicion. Okay, so if your suspicion is money laundering based, for an example, then you're going to file a suspicious activity report. Okay, and then uh, we have um, section 28 reports with the cash threshold report. So these reports are, are based on a threshold. So our threshold at this point in time is 24. Uh, 99999. So what it means is that or in layman's term, I may say 25,000. So we have two types of reports in this uh, uh, category of reports in section 28. We have a CTR, we have a CTRA. So a CTR, this is a type of report where that you file if somebody came to your premises, um, they made a, a cash deposit or a lump sum uh, of above that threshold. So they may have paid it at your, your your premises or they have paid it at your uh, uh, bank account so if they have made a cash deposit but this does not include EFTs so if in case you suspect something based on an EFT then you're going to file a section 29 report but if it's a cash they came and they paid an amount of above 24 triple nine double nine you're going to file CTR but if they have made the same payment in, in, in peace mills, for an example, 5,000, 10,000, 3,000 there, and, and uh, within a period of 24 hours, and is the same client who makes this payment, then you're going to file a CTRA. So this is a cash threshold report aggregation. So just take note of that, the difference between this type of reports. So if somebody pays in peace mills within 24 hours, you're going to file a CTRA. If they pay one lump sum, then is a CTR, okay? Okay, and then we now have a, terror, a TPR, which is a terrorist property report, section 28A report. Uh, so what this report requires that if you have been in control or in position of a property, uh, which you suspect that they, they are, it, that property is used for um, terrorist reasons, then you're going to file a TPR. So, but just take note that only accountable institutions are, are obligated to file this type of reports. If you are not an, uh, an obligated institution, sorry, if you are not a, 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 an accountable institution, you can file a Section 29 report. Okay. 
Reporting feedback. Uh, these are just things that you must take note uh, if you are going to report on GoML. All reports must be submitted on GoML, like I've highlighted earlier. We do not have any other platform where you can file a report. Each user must log in with their own user credentials to submit reports. So if you have 10 users at your entity, you must have 10 different user uh, uh, registration appearing on GoML. So you can't have one user detail for for all 10 users. Ensure that uh, the correct report type is selected. So this is uh, one cause of uh, major rejections uh, of reports that get submitted. So for an example, you now select CTR uh, report and you do not provide any transaction there. Uh, then we're going to, 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 to have issues. Okay, uh, or you submit an STR report and uh, you, you do not provide the ID number or, or 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 you select so when you select the type of a report the form is a uh, different from any other form so it's it's well suited for the type of report that you're going to select and they when you select the type of report that type of report has different expectations as you go down completing the details so if you may not have some of the information that report is going to be rejected so ensure that reports are submitted under the correct branch and correct schedule item so uh, in most cases we do understand uh, different gambling um, uh, institutions have various branches may some of them across the country so make sure that uh, whenever you file a report do not use the head office please make sure you use the, uh, the 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 respective branch of your of your of of where the report is related to so so if for an example you are uh, a report is for gateway uh, in Durban, uh, you can't use uh, 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 your branch in in, in Gauteng. So please select the correct branch and reports must be reviewed before being submitted. So what it means that we don't we do not have a recall button here. So once you submit, you have submitted. So please make sure uh, you click submit when you are ready, when you are ready and you are happy uh, with the information that you have captured there. So the message board must constantly be monitored as well, because uh, if you submit a report, that's where we send all this information, uh, whether the, your report has been rejected or it has been approved and uh, other uh, and as well as other information from the FIC where we, we, we want to highlight to you. So please make sure you every time I suggest that before you log in, you always check your message board. OK. So information required for reporting. OK, there are two parties uh, for every transaction as far as the FIC understands. So there's a payer and the receiver. But uh, we also understand that there can possibly be three types of role players. So you can, it can be a natural person and uh, an entity and an account. OK, so uh, when uh, money flows uh, from uh, these two payers, we can we expect that on the other end, there will be one type of a role player and on the, on the other end can be uh, a, a, another role player. But it can only be a, a natural person, entity or an account. OK, for, and for transaction, one of the parties should be my client. So if you try to log in a report, you will realize that um, uh, 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 you, you are expected to select one of the parties. I mean, so so one of the party, they make sure you select my client. So what this is means that I will just give a typical example. If somebody goes to your uh, bank account and make a, a deposit of uh, 25,000 rand, so uh, the bank is going to file a report and the bank is going to say my client uh, so and so in this case it's yourselves because the bank has kyc you. they didn't kyc the person who went to make the cash deposit so they will say my client so and so has received twenty five thousand on the account and then uh, the bank is done so now it's it's it has to be because at the end of the day we want to know where who actually deposited that money so uh, now it's for you now to go and uh, file another report as well and you say my client so and so has made a cash deposit into my account so the legs will be complete because if the bank only files a report then we end up not knowing who the person who actually make uh, made that cash deposit so please make sure one of the parties has to be your client and you provide us with the the, the client details just like the bank will give you will give us your details 
Okay, and if we're reporting, okay, if reporting transaction, the full details of the transaction must be uh, reported. For an example, the amount, the the transaction date, the transaction location, uh, the, the 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 account name. If you using a system which generates uh, accounts and things like that. Okay, and if reporting an activity, we expect that the full details of the activity must be uh, provided as well. But we do understand that on an activity type of a report. You may not have the full details of the uh, of the the, the 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 person maybe coming to 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 uh, who you want to report, for an example. So it's very important. You'll give us the name that he has given you. Uh, you'll give us the date when it occurs. Uh, what really happened? You'll have to give us that whole story in chronological order and in a way that we can make sense of that report. And you'll also have to include the goods and services which uh, uh, were being, uh, or maybe this person, in, in your case, it, it will be that service that somebody wanted to gamble or whatever it is. Okay. So when you're filing a report, uh, the, uh, especially the, 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 the cash threshold type of report, uh, in this case, or any type of a report for that matter, it's very important that you select the correct report type and the reporting person area, uh, make sure there is information in there, but automatically this information will uh, um, call the information of the person who is logged in and the location and the indicators, indicator is, relation, is in relation to the type of report, of course, and the transactions. Okay, the transactions, also very important. So, uh, like I said, a, a transaction must show the flow of funds. So, uh, from and to. So, uh, and either on the from, it will be from person and join account on, or on a to, it will again be from a person entity or an account. So, one party will be involved in them. Okay. Okay, so in a case of a, 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 a transaction report, um, uh, like I said earlier, you must select the type of a report. In this case, it's going to be CTR if a lump sum or one amount, big amount was paid into your bank account or at your premises. So just take note, only cash, we're talking cash here. So uh, the report time, that's number one. Number two, the reporting person, so the, uh, the, uh, the reporting person information will come automatically based on uh, who uh, logged in. So that is why I'm saying it's very important for, for every person to have, uh, to have uh, their own uh, details whenever they are logging in uh, on the system. Okay, the location, uh, this is the location where uh, the, the transaction is taking place or it has taken place. And uh, now we have the indicators. Okay, the indicator will be based on the report time. Uh, this is basically giving us an indicator to the type of a report and uh, uh, the, 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 the indicators to why I'm filing that report must show based on that uh, indicator. So it, it will be this uh, cash threshold or cash threshold uh, aggregation or whatever. And the transaction. Okay, so we'll have to give us uh, the transaction. And please, uh, what, what, one other thing that uh, you must also take into cognizant on the transaction is the transmode code. So if you have received the money, uh, somebody has made uh, a payment into your entity, please, you have to select cash received by AI or RI. And if you have uh, made that payment, please make sure on the transmode you select cash paid by II or RI. Okay. Okay, uh, on the transaction mode, uh, sorry, on the transaction report again uh, on number five, uh, that is basically the layout of the transaction screen. So, okay, so you'll have to give us the, okay, so if you see on that number, when you click those uh, machines, slow, small machines there, when you click on them, uh, the, the transaction number, automatically gets generated and you'll have to give us the internal reference numbers and provide all that information. And on the from type, which is the most place which I really want to emphasize, uh, uh, select my client 
uh, on one of the parties or on the two, it can also be my client. But uh, make sure one of the parties there is my client and give us all the details of that respective client. OK. So on activity report now, uh, if we look at it, uh, the type of a report must be selected is either SAR, TFAR, TFTR. So uh, uh, the reporting person, that information will come automatically, just like on the cash uh, threshold type of a report. And uh, the indicator as well, similarly to what I've presented earlier, and uh, the activity on, and on the activity, you're going to give us all the, the the information as to what really transpired and uh, uh, what may what really raised your eyebrows why are you why are you filing this report so okay uh, here's a, a, a sample screen of an activity report so uh, like it appears there the type of a report you have to provide us and number two, there is uh, the reason for reporting. Please give us that information in detail as to why are you reporting. And the action, uh, please make sure if the action you, you can see, it's not, a, it's not a mandatory field, but if you didn't provide the action, your reports get rejected. So please make sure you provide the action as well. So the action basically is just an indication as to what really happened. I mean, what, what have you done after you have filed that report? Uh, sorry, what really, what have you done after you have identified uh, 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 that uh, uh, suspicion? So in most cases, I'm very much aware, most entities, they do indicate that they have filed, uh, they have reported to the FIC. But uh, in case you have submitted that report to the SAPS, then you just indicate that you have submitted to the SAPS, okay? And the reporting person, the location, please make sure you provide the correct branch as indicated earlier and the indicator and the, uh, the activity, okay? Okay, I think I'll just go to the next slide, general GoML functionality. Uh, what can you do on GoML? You can submit a new regulatory report, access draft report. So you can see on the top menu there on that sample, uh, if you have logged in on GoML before, you will be familiar with that screen. So uh, you can submit new reports. You can access draft reports. Uh, you can view uh, uh, previously submitted reports under that submitted reports. And we have a message board there where you can see various messages that has been pushed to you from the FIC and including uh, various uh, messages that has been pushed to you after you have submitted a report. And you can see my GoML. So under my GoML, that's where you can update your user and entity details and uh, uh, view related user details and statistical information. OK. Um, OK, general GoML functionality, just if we continue a little bit. Um, uh, on the new report uh, screen, uh, you can see there you can be able to file a new report and select, uh, let's say it's a uh, on the report type, you can select whether it's a CTR, CTRA, TFTR, uh, uh, STR, SAR, or various types of reports that you can you can select them. And then you complete the report accordingly. So underneath there you can see uh, I have highlighted the submit report. So if you can see the submit, the safe report, so you save report if you still want to get more information. Uh, so that report, once you save, is going to go and sit on the drafted reports. But if you are now happy with the report and you want to uh, submit, then you click submit. So you, if you submit while you are not, that your report is not completed, just be aware that uh, that report is gone. It's either it's going to be rejected or it's going to be approved. And it's going to sit on your submitted reports. OK. So what happens once you uh, submit a report uh, to the FIC? A notification is generated, which, which uh, goes on your message board, and uh, it also goes on your email. Um, so the, that's why it's also important that you have all your uh, details uh, updated here on the, on the system, because uh, if your email is not uh, properly updated or you're using an email of somebody who has already left your institution, then you are not going to receive that notification. 
unless you log on on message board and a unique uh, reference number of that report gets generated as well. OK, um, I have indicated already about the drafted reports that uh, on drafted reports, that's where if you save a report uh, gets uh, gets uh, to to be located. OK, on the message board, so I have uh, presented to you now a slide uh, where I have added a snippet of how a message board looks like. So if you have submitted the report, OK, no, that, that's a submitted report. So on submitted report, you can see that uh, you have rejected and you have processed reports. So that's when you can be able to see your report. So we also encourage you to save your reports and file them somewhere uh, every time you file your reports. Uh, so that you can uh, have um, a record of all the reports that you have submitted to the FIC. It's very important for, for, for you to note that once you submit a report to the FIC, uh, that report, uh, the FIC becomes the custodian of that report. So we do not send report back. So we're not going to send that report to you, maybe let's say on request and say, please send me, I've submitted a report. Uh, can you please, please provide me with the details of that report? So we do not do that. The only people who are only allowed to send the reports to is our um, uh, your SAPS, uh, uh, Zondo Commission or Commission of Inquiries, your uh, NPA, SIU, uh, such uh, entities, not to reporting institutions or accountable institutions, including yourselves, who have filed that report. So please uh, just take note of that. So please make sure you keep your own records when you file or when you interact with the FIC. So one other thing that I have to indicate to you is that when a report has been rejected, we request that you do not file a new report. Please uh, go to that report which was rejected. So if you go to that I in the uh, on the last uh, column, you see there's a save button and then that small I there. When you click on that report, the pop up will show will show up. Uh, the pop up will look like that, and then um, with the report uh, rejection reason, and then you click that revert button. When you click that revert button, that report is going to go and sit on. Uh, a drafted reports and then you're going to from there you can be able to edit it and resubmit that report with all the uh, information which was missing earlier because you will have been given a reason as why was your report rejected okay the message board looks like that uh, so all your reports you can see there uh, on the message board with reports that have been that has been fully accepted and reports that have been rejected. So it's very important that you always check your message board. You monitor it and ensure that uh, all your reports uh, are, are processed. And if not processed, then you fix whatever that is uh, expected. And if I may highlight uh, 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 again is that when you file a section 28 uh, section 28 report, you are expected to file it within 48 hours. Section 29, you are expected to file it within 15 days. And Section 28A, you need to file with it within five days of becoming aware. So please uh, take note of those uh, regulated timeframes uh, so that you can file your reports accordingly. So if a report comes late, uh, it, that can uh, amount to transgression of the FIC Act. So please just be careful as far as that is concerned. OK. Um, so if you file a report, for an example, when it sits on the on the message board, uh, there is also a, an attachment that is provided in there. If you open that attachment, it will have the report name, date, and the status of that report. Status meaning if it has been rejected or it has been uh, processed. So uh, just take note, uh, that is the type of uh, screenshot that we, we that normally looks like. OK, and background and reference materials, please uh, just uh, be uh, friends with the FIC uh, website uh, so that you can be able to get all the information uh, of the of uh, of the regulation and uh, training material and various uh, 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 guidance notes and uh, communications that we sent to the entities. So please uh, just uh, always visit our website uh, and, and, and check in there. So for an example, if you want to understand how registration works and the purpose of registration, you see that the registration in terms of section 43B, 
uh, of the FIC Act. This was a public compliance communication 05C. So if you go on that uh, public compliance communication, you will be able to see the registration process and um, and, the, and your understanding of the act as far as the registration is concerned. Okay, so so I won't go through that whole material uh, that that appears there, but uh, please just take note of it. And uh, this material is also available on our website. Okay, thank you so much. And and if you want to, for an example, you you file you, you have various challenges. Let's say you're trying to file a report and you have those different challenges or you want to query something, it's very easy. Go on our website uh, under uh, contact us. Uh, you'll see a public query platform there, and then you, you click on that uh, 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 compliance query uh, uh, form, and then you fill all your, all your details, and then we'll get back to you. Thank you so much. Uh, over to you, Smo. Thank you very much, Bunkosi. Thank you very much, Bongo. Sorry for that echo, colleagues. Uh, now, uh, colleagues, the only thing that I say that no, uh, this uh, for me, it was an informative session. And then, as, as although I'm part of the framework, and then I've learned a lot of things from the discussions that we had today. And please do not forget to uh, complete your attendance register. And then these slides are going to be shared uh, with the emails that you're going to receive from the particular register or the, uh, the number of people that you're going to receive from the specific register. And as we asked uh, a bit earlier, if you have any questions, please append them on the Q&A uh, slot. I see that a lot of questions that we have actually uh are from all over the place but the first one i think is it was directed to brian and then the first question is uh, should we accept business bank statements from panthers when we do reporting okay no, it's a reporting question so it's it's, uh, it's for Bongosi. so i'll ask Bongosi just to answer the question for us uh, it's a question that states that should we accept bank statements from panthers when we do reporting and we can use the bank statements as proof of residence as well. Uh, over to you, Bongosi. Okay, thank you, Smooth. Okay, thank you, Sue. Uh, uh, we do not actually uh, need a, 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 um, a proof of registration when you're registering with the FIC. Uh, all we need is the uh, the authorization letter and the the passport. If uh, you're registering somebody who is uh, not a South African uh, 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 citizen or the ID copy. That's all we need. So we do not need uh, uh, we do not need a bank statement from our side or, or any proof of registration or a proof of address. Sorry. Thanks. Sorry once again, colleagues. I know that some of our ideas are pending as we speak. Uh, the following uh, question is, is a question of uh, <clears throat> the slides again. Is it possible for me, from Tondani Lambani, is it possible for me to have, uh, I think you meant to say, uh, those notes? Yes, it's possible as long as you complete the register and then these particular slides and notes will be sent to, to you. The next question, what is the cash threshold reporting amount and will it change in future? Okay. 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 The cash threshold amount uh, at this point in time is uh, 24999 or you can say 25000 um, 
it it may change in future yes but uh, when that change happens a communication will be sent in will be sent to you and your entities so that you can be able to know uh, that uh, the threshold amount has changed. So at the moment, the threshold has not changed. It's still uh, 24 triple nine double nine. Thank you so much, Sue. Thank you, Wongi. Uh, the following question is: What is it? Is the time period within which a suspicious and unusual transaction must be reported? I think that was covered on the on the presentation. But can you please? Just uh, elaborate, uh, uh, clarify again to our colleagues on what is the time period within which a suspicious and unusual transaction must be reported. OK. Um, uh, Section 29 type of a report uh, must be filed within uh, 15 days. So Section 29, we're referring to uh, we're referring to the the SAR, STR, TFAR, TFTR. So those ones must be filed within 15 days. Um, and if I may now, might as well I might as well uh, uh, give you the, the 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 other ones. The other ones must be filed within uh, uh, that section 28. It must be filed within 48 hours and section 28a must be filed within five days of becoming aware thank you so much thank you thank you very much uh, for that bongi uh, the next question is are there scenarios where an accountable institution must report both a ctr and an str so are there situations where a ctr and an str must be reported at the same time Okay, okay, the question I'll repeat it for you, Bonkosi. The question is, are there scenarios where an accountable institution must report both a CTR and an STR? Okay, uh, thank you, Spuso. Uh, yes, it is possible. You can have a scenario where you have to report a CTR and an STR. So uh, um, uh, let's say for an example, somebody comes to your branch and uh, they, 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 they make a payment of about uh, uh, of above the threshold, let's say 30,000 rand, I'm just giving an example. And uh, you will have to file automatically by default, you will have to file a CTR if they have made it in lump sum. But if they've made it in piecemeal within 24 hours, you'll have to file a CTR. -A. But uh, at the same time, if uh, you suspect that no, uh, this client is not the usual client, uh, he, he, he looks suspicious and uh, it looks like he's using us to clean his money uh, for terrorist reasons and then you may again file a, a tftr which is a terrorist financing uh, transaction report so it's such scenarios where you can you, you can file two types of reports uh, for the same client thank you thank you thank you very much uh, for that bongi and then our next question is uh in respect of single transactions below 5,000 rands concluded between a bookmaker and a customer, what is advisable in respect of complying with the applicable legislation? No anonymous customers, many of the transactions may be as small as 2,000 rands. I'll repeat that again. In respect of a single transaction below 5,000 rands concluded between a bookmaker and a customer, what is advisable in respect of complying with the applicable legislation, no anonymous customers. So many of the transactions may be a small uh, 2,000 rents. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, Uh, while we are just uh, figuring it out. Okay, in, in that instance, in respect of the transaction below 5,000 rands, so 
you remember that uh, both Bongi and Brian responded by saying that all the information that is received from clients uh, is, should be recorded and then you can't enter into uh, any business relationship or transaction without uh, knowing the person or the client that you're entering into a, a business with. So if we have a lot of 5,000 rents and they add up to the limited threshold of 24,999, that needs to be reported uh, by a bookmaker or the, 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 the person who's dealing with the, the particular transaction. Uh, in that, in this instance, it, it is that uh, you can't, for a case threshold report, any amount that is above, if the 5,000 rents, they add up to uh, the amount of 25,000 rents, that should be a case threshold recoverable uh, transaction in a specific period uh, of, of time. And then ap apart from that, uh, even if it's, it's 2,000 rents, the same will uh, apply. And you remember that you don't uh, conduct a business without knowing the person I'm conducting business with. It even boils down a step further where you need to identify an ultimate beneficial owner of a particular transaction. If someone wins a certain amount of money, Brian alluded to this a bit earlier, that you need to produce your identification so that you'll be able to transact or be given money by the gambling institution. In that instance, there should be a track record confirming the amounts that have been won or they've been given to and from the clients. And then that record, uh, if the amount adds to 25,000 rents, uh, CTR will be recorded. If, if there's any uh, suspicious activity that is related to, to those uh, particular funds or amounts, uh, a suspicious transaction report should be uh, 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 put forward as stipulated under section 29 of the FIT Act. Uh, Bongo side, yeah, record nine, you can just uh, elaborate on that as well. Okay, yeah, I think, uh, you are very correct. Uh, so if payments are below the threshold, what you're going to do, you will have to file uh, uh, a, a section 29 report if you suspect that, no, this guy is making payments of 2000. And one other thing uh, you must understand that, uh, uh, let's say somebody now comes and makes a payment of 2000. Some people are very much aware that uh, you can only file a CTRA if a payment has been made within 24 hours. So they can come and make a 5,000 now, 5,000 uh, later after 24 hours or after 48 hours and uh, later again make another another payment. And uh, on a suspicious transaction, I'll give you an example. Somebody can come and make that payment uh, from um, one, maybe a, a make a, makes a cash deposit or makes an, an EFT. And then uh, when they want uh, after without without them even gambling or playing, they say, uh, kindly give me a refund. I no longer want to play. And then when you have to give them a refund, they give you a different type of an account. Not the same account uh, uh, which they, they've made uh, a payment from. And then automatically you know that, no, there's something suspicious. As much as the amount is below the threshold, but something is suspicious here. Yeah. And then you'll have to file a, a suspicious transaction. First suspicious transaction report. But if they didn't gamble and you didn't get any amount, you didn't get any, they were intending to play uh, maybe uh, for such low amounts and they ended up not playing and ended up not registering on the on the on the book. Uh, what do you mean that you'll have to find a suspicious activity uh, type of a report? Thank you so much. Wu. Thank you very much uh, for that, Bonkosi. And then we have another question. Uh, furthermore, in terms of obtaining proof of identity from customers and other requisite fee card documents, is it acceptable to obtain same only upon a customer requesting to withdraw their winnings as a, a customer would do? So I think you covered past, uh, partially, partially covered this uh, question uh, on your previous uh, answer, but please uh, go ahead, Bonkosi. Okay, as far as the FIC Act is concerned, uh, you need to KYC your customers uh, prior to you doing business with them. So you cannot get their ID copies later in the process what if they don't give you the 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 the, 
the IDs, and now you you have to file as as, as a transaction report because uh, you already have done business with this person. So uh, you need to find a way to get all this information uh, before you do any business with your customers uh, to fulfill your obligation as far as the FIC Act is concerned. So so it is advisable that you do get all this information in KYC them. You have so you know even when now they go and see sit and do their business. Or, I mean sit sit and do their gambling or whatever. All those who are participating are people that you know. So instead of uh, having uh, people you don't know participating and later you want the ID, they cannot give you the ID. Um, uh, uh, then that will create a lot of problems as far as the FIC Act is concerned. Thank you so much. Sorry for that, I was, uh, I was just getting my thoughts together. The next question is, would a picture taken for a person's ID with a cell phone suffice as proof? Okay, I think that uh, now talks to your risk-based uh, approach as to how do you want to uh, uh, identify your customers, but um, from our side, what we're going to need from you when you file a report uh, is your your uh, the ID uh, number and their full details. So uh, I don't think uh, uh, taking a picture uh, can replace an ID. So I think an ID like you see on various financial institutions, uh, when you get there, you want to open an account with them. They also take a picture uh, of their uh, prospective customers, but they still need the ID copy. So you cannot use the ID, uh, the, 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 the picture alone as the, the proof of identification only. So, so, but you need to factor, you need to factor that uh, also into your risk based approach as to uh, how do you want to really uh, identify your customers in your business? But as far as the FIC is concerned, please make sure you provide us all the necessary details that we need from our side whenever we receive a report uh, from you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bongosi. Uh, oh, I think we have enough time, but uh, the number of questions that we have are limited. So the next question that we have is when onboarding a client, must the institution check if they are on a targeted financial sanctions list? Oh, thank you very much. On that, yes, uh, you are at all times. We need to, when we're doing a transaction, we are not allowed, the accountable institutions are not allowed to conduct any transactions with people who are listed. Uh, on the targeted financial sanctions list. So the, there are two lists that uh, this question refers to. The first list is the list that is published by the United Nations uh, Security Council. And the second list is the list, uh, is the, sim the similar list, actually, the same list is also published uh, on the FIC website. So for you to be able to identify the institutions or individuals who are on the targeted financial sections list, that is where you need to uh, go and look. But in the coming months, we are also going to have a session, a webinar session, where we are only going to focus on uh, sanctions, targeted financial, sanctions, targeted financial sanctions list, and then please register for that uh, webinar so that you will get a detailed uh, information when it comes to onboarding clients who are on the targeted financial sanctions uh, list or who might be sanctions or institutions who might be sanctions uh, sanctioned as well. And I think uh, with that, we have covered almost all the questions for the day. If you have any additional questions, please, uh, you're more than welcome to use our public compliance query 
uh, on the FIC website. So you uh, you can put in you can put forward any questions to our PQP uh, systems, and then we'll be able to uh, come back to you. But if you have anything that is active, and then you need to need some, need some clarity on, you are also uh, welcome to come contact our compliance contact center on 012-641-6000 and also visit our website for you to get guidance on uh, the PQPs that we referred to earlier, the P PCCs, the public compliance communications, the directives or any guidance that we might require in terms of the FIC Act. On that note, colleagues, we'll give you back your 19 minutes and thank you very much until our next webinar. Thank you, colleagues.